Hello and welcome. My name is Shannon Kemp and I'm the Chief Digital Manager for Dataversity. We would like to thank you for joining this Dataversity webinar, Knowledge Graphs versus Property Graphs, sponsored today by Top Quadrant. Just a couple of points to get us started. Due to the large number of people that attend these sessions, you will be muted during the webinar. For questions, we will be collecting them via the Q&A in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen. Or if you'd like to tweet, we encourage you to share highlights or questions via Twitter using hashtag Dataversity. And if you'd like to chat with us or with each other, we certainly encourage you to do so. Just click the chat icon in the bottom right-hand corner of your screen for that feature. And as always, we will send a follow-up email within two business days containing links to the slides, the recording of this session, and additional information requested throughout the webinar. Now let me introduce to you our speaker for today, Irene Polakoff. Irene has more than two decades of experience in software development, management, consulting, and strategic planning. Since co-founding Top Quadrant in 2001, Irene has been involved in more than a dozen projects in government and commercial sectors. She has written strategy papers, trained customers on the use of the semantic web standards, developed ontology models, designed solution architectures, and defined deployment process and guidance. And with that, I will give the floor to Irene to get today's webinar started. Hello and welcome. Thank you, Shannon. And um, I should be sharing my screen, so you should be seeing slides. So as I get started, first let me say a few words about Top Quadrant as a company we uh, were founded back in 2001, which is the same year that semantic standards, uh, semantic web standards first became available. And the technology that we work with has been progressively over the years uh, known as semantic web technology, then linked data technology, and then more recently knowledge graph technology, because as, as graphs became uh, better known and more of a household name, it's fundamentally a graph uh, technology for the web. Um, from the beginning, Top Quadrant's mission was to help organizations uh, bring applica uh, build applications that uh, make enterprise information meaningful and um, more re recently since about 2016 we have been working on uh, enterprise data governance applications connecting uh, enterprise information. So our today's agenda is on this slide and it has a picture of me a few years ago as uh, many of us I, I um, think that hopefully I haven't changed that much at least I like to think that way. And I'm a CEO and co-founder of Top Quadrant, and today we will um, start with a brief overview of two uh, graph data models and technologies, pro property graphs and knowledge graphs. We discuss differences uh, in terminologies and capabilities for these two different technologies, strengths and limitation of either, and then we um, talk about uh, why knowledge graphs provide uh, a strong foundation for data-centric enterprise applications. And uh, in doing that, we'll talk a bit about what it means um, to move to data-centric uh, applications. I'll do a couple of um, short demos to demonstrate uh, how graphs look like and work. And hopefully we'll take a bit of time for, we'll have a bit of time left for Q&A. All right, with that, uh, let's get started. And I have a few definitions here of um, a knowledge graph as a term. And they come from different sources. And um, uh, here is, of course, the source of all truth, uh, also known as Wikipedia. And there's um, some differences in those definitions, but also uh, quite a bit of similarity. You know, essentially, this is um, um, knowledge graphs provi provide a way to organize data about real world um, objects, real world entities in a graph, and together with this data, there's also information about the data model. So here you could see it talks about possible classes and relationships and the schema, and in the Wikipedia we talk about, you know, semantics of this real world objects, and this definition in the middle uh, talks about ontology, which is again the model. Um, a term used to describe the model behind behind the data. We at Top Quadrant, having worked with this technology for quite some time, um, also have um, our definition of what are the knowledge graphs. So um, fundamentally, we um, 
believe that knowledge graphs represent information about some domain of knowledge and uh, represent this with uh, active models, models that uh, can be consulted at runtime. This information is stored in the form of a graph. What it means is that there are nodes and links or connections between nodes, as opposed to, for example, tables with rows and columns as you would have in a spreadsheet or in a relational database. And uh, importantly, knowledge graphs can contain both the, the actual data of facts as well as the information model behind those facts all as part of a graph, and this model can, can drive interesting behavior, including rules, inferencing, and so on. And another important fact is that um, knowledge graphs are based on open standards from top to bottom, so from the data to the models of the data and rules. And the reason that uh, we believe um, this is important is because even within a single enterprise, you have a variety of information, and you will not be able to uh, put all of that in, in one knowledge graph. So interoperability, connectivity, uh, et cetera, are very important to, um, uh, for, for the graphs. And the structure of the graphs makes that possible, uh, but you also need uh, open standards in order to uh, make this information shareable, connectable, and, and so on. So um, ability for the knowledge graph to grow and evolve over time is important. Um, so let's take a look at how a knowledge graph may uh, look like. And uh, this is kind of using knowledge graph recipe. We also sometimes sometimes talk about RDF knowledge graphs, and RDF is, you know, the data model or standard behind the knowledge graph stores stands for a resource description framework. So here on, on the left, we see a bit of a model or ontology that talks about um, organizations that have some vehicles, design models of the vehicles, and, and, and so on. And on, um, so that's, uh, that's a model or schema with classes, properties, uh, etc. And then on the right, we have a little bit of a data that um, uh, uses this model. So here we see BMW as an organization, and it has some car models uh, designed in um, some some year. And you could imagine additional data that maybe has to do with a number of those models sold, their popularity, prices, and so on. So when we combine this together, um, you know, this is kind of a blueprint, and this is the actual data, and combining it together, we have our knowledge graph. So ontology plus instance data, that's a recipe for uh, a knowledge graph. Now, um, having talked about knowledge graphs a bit and, you know, pointing out that they are based on the standards, there, so therefore there is a standard data model behind uh, RDF knowledge graphs. With respect to property graphs, I will describe them, and as I describe them, I uh, want to uh, make a caveat that there is really no uh, de facto, de jure, standard property graph data model. There are quite a number of different implementations that they are all calling their implementations as property graphs or labeled property graphs. There's lots of similarity. Uh, in those implementations, but there's also some differences depending on a particular vendor product. Uh, what I will talk about today uh, will tend to be um, in facts that are similar, identical across different implementations. So they, they're true for different implementations. I will not go into details that may be uh, different, at least by and large. And in general, in a property graph data model, we have three elements. There are nodes, which are entities, you know, nodes in a graph. There are links between them, also called edges. And these are relationships between nodes. And then there are properties. Properties are key value pairs that kind of hang off either nodes or edges. Um, so let's take a look at it by example. 
And in this example, I'm going to use some um, data from the entertainment industry. So you see two nodes here. One has ID 1 to 3, another one has ID 1 to 5. You also have a relationship between them. And um, depicted here in yellow, you have properties that are hanging off those nodes and also a property that's kind of hanging off the, off the link or an edge. So uh, 1 to 3 uh, stands for Tom Hanks, and you see first name, last name, year born as a property. And 1 to 5 is a movie. You see the name of the movie when it was released. So these are also properties. So these are um, um, literal key value pairs, such as integers, strings, and, and, and so on. And then you see here that the relationship between them has a type. In um, some implementations, this may not be called a type, um, may have another word, but quite often it's called a type. And it also has an idea of its own. And there is a bit of information uh, hanging off that as, um, as a property. So um, we see that Tom Hanks acting in the movie The Post had a role uh, playing Ben Bradley. And then uh, we also see blue rectangles that contain labels. So um, the fuller name of a property graph data model is labeled property graph. And labels are essentially types of those nodes. They are stored similarly to how these properties are stored, but because these are strings associating essentially a type with each node. So you see that Tom is a person, a director, and an actor. Um, but they are uh, they are special kind of properties, and that's why they're shown in the blue here. So let's uh, expand our graph. We see another person. This is a person and an actor, Sarah Paulson, and she also acted in this movie. So another acted, uh, another link of a type acted in, but different ID, and she played Tony Bradley. And we keep on expanding the graph, so we now see that. Um, Tom is a director. He directed uh, a TV series, and then we see more connections uh, from the post to the location that um, this movie was filmed in, and more information about uh, about those locations. So now let's take a look at this same information um, of how would it look like in in an RDF knowledge graph. Um, as, as I move there, uh, take, uh, take a note of these IDs. So you see numeric IDs, they, they get assigned by, by your property graph system, some internal IDs similarly to how a relational database may assign some IDs. So I'm going to show you exactly the same information um, captured in an RDF knowledge graph. So here we see information about Tom. And um, here's a note representing him. And here is his birth date, uh, his uh, given name, family name. And then we see two links, two types. Um, and uh, we see that he is an actor. So this note is of type actor and of type director. Um, I don't have a type person here. And later on, it will become clear why not. And then he acted in, in a movie. Uh, the post. So um, a couple of things to point here. One has to do with IDs. So you see the ID has kind of two parts. One is a part before the column and another one a part after the column. So um, the part before the column is actually is a prefix that stands for the namespace. So you see if we wanted to expand it as a full RID, will have the entire URI. So Wikidata stands for this namespace. And then you have a local part of the ID at the end. How exactly IDs are assigned? Um, you, as a user of the Knowledge Graph systems, have some control over. You could select different namespaces, and you also have some control over how the local part is generated. 
And the reason it's important is, be, is because, as I mentioned before, you know, there may be multiple knowledge graphs that could be connected together. I mean, specifically Wikidata, for example, is a knowledge graph that contains all the information in the Wikipedia in this kind of structured, credible um, knowledge graph format. So in, in, this, in this knowledge graph, Tom Hanks actually exists exist as a node, and uh, we could connect um, to the information in this external graph, and it could be useful to reuse the ID that is being used in Wikidata for a variety of purposes, you know, as a, as a reference data or to, um, uh, to assist in merging and connecting between different graphs and so on. So we could do that. Or we could also mint our own uh, IDs using different strategies. So that's um, one difference. Let's um, let's keep expanding our graph, and we see here information about Sarah Paulson, her name, um, she acted in this movie. We see um, a league of their own, which is TV series, and then we see information about locations. So another thing that you may already notice is that information is stored in a very regular way. Everything is a node in a graph. So the node representing Tom Hanks is a node. Um, the node with his name or his uh, birth date is a node. Um, instead of being a different separate uh, structure, data structure, it's just a node and everything is connected via relationships as a link. So uh, as links. So this uh, highly canonical structure. And then types are also, all of them are nodes in, in a graph. So very canonical representation. And um, that's, uh, we're going to have this rolling slide of differences and similarities we move, uh, as we move along. So uh, we've talked about IDs and property graphs being internal to a specific graph database with no control for the user. And in the knowledge graph, IDs are global, globally unique URIs. They can be under user control to support combining different graphs. And then um, canonical structure, in one case, you have nodes, relationships, properties, very different things structurally. In another thing, in another case, everything's stored as a graph um, with, with nodes and links connecting them. Um, so let's talk about schema as part of the knowledge graph. And here I have highlighted some of the nodes in red because they are special. They are types or classes. Um, they are also have the identity, the same, uh, same type of identity, so they have URIs, so IDs, just like, you know, Tom and the post, the movie have identity. They are part of the graph. We could uh, store information about them, about those types or classes, and in fact, we do. So um, here is, um, you could see why I did not have, um, why I did not say in my original representation that Tom is also a person and not just an actor and a director. This is because I am putting this information on the class itself. I'm saying that the actor is subclass of a person and director is subclass of the person. And because I say that, I don't have to say that for every actor, for every director, it's captured in a schema. And um, I could connect movie and TV series because both of them are subclasses of this class creative work. I could say more about the uh, city uh, being ultimately a place and the subclass of administrative area. I could capture other information including like display names or labels. So this is for the edge, uh, for the relationship connecting uh, called acted in, so I could have a human readable label for it. And I could do more. I could actually capture very rich schemas as part of the knowledge graph. So we could see uh, a small example here where uh, this slide shows the kind of properties that um, 
a class creative work um, is described with. So we could see that uh, there can be a release property for um, instances of type creative work. And this release property, um, its type would be a date. And um, it cannot be more than one, at least in my model, in my ontology, there cannot be more than one release date for the creative work. And also, you know, this is how I am defining here. It has to be larger than 1900 because in, in my, in the kind of data that I am capturing, I'm talking about movies and TV series. series so you cannot have something from 1700s. Uh, so this is just uh, one example of how information about uh, properties, relationships, and literal values can be described in a very rich way. The same way um, even richer definitions can be captured, including, including rules. And this is important because um, increasingly this type of models called ontologies, as well as controlled vocabularies of reference data, are being developed in different, um, in different industries and being reused, uh, which facilitates interoperability. So here's a few examples. In my example, I'm actually using schema.org. And schema.org is an um, ontology developed jointly by uh, Google and uh, a few other, being a few other search engines. And this is to facilitate annotations um, of the information on the website. So it, it could be presented structurally and drive smarter searches. So I'm using uh, properties and classes, class definitions from this uh, schema.org in my example, as well as my own. You could combine your own and you could extend standard ontologies. Um, there is um, lots of domain-specific ontologies. Fiber is for is a financial industry business ontology. There is quite a number of ontologies in um, uh, life sciences and medical domains. So Mesh is one of them, medical subjects. Headings, NOMAD is another one. QDT is a standard model for um, quantities, units, and uh, dimensions. So all of this um, is quite useful because you could use those standard ontologies to support um, interoperability and the emerging uh, cognitive enterprise. Um, so um, another difference is how schemas are treated. Uh, in property graphs versus RDF knowledge graphs. When you implement the property graph, you will do develop some kind of a data model because you know you, you need to know what data you will be um, you will be capturing and how it's going to look like. You'll need it in order to write your applications, write your queries, etc. And there are some methodologies for data modeling for property graphs. You do your data model kind of separate from your graph sort of um, off-band, maybe using a piece of paper, maybe using some uh, whiteboarding exercises, uh, maybe using PowerPoint or another tool. And then once you um, develop the model, then you organize the data according this to this model. But the model stays in, in another artifact. It's never actually uh, part of the graph. And if you need to make a change, you again go back to your um, paper-based or some, some other based representation. Uh, with um, knowledge graphs, it's more integrated because you actually model within the graph and then data is structured according to this, mod uh, this model. So it's, it's uh, more seamless in, in that way. Your model lives in the graph. Um, and uh, this, this is probably a good place for me to uh, stop for a second and show um, a bit of a demo that can um, that can actually um, bring this concept to uh, to life. So let me switch and I am now in in a tool. It's um, it's our product called Tabred Edge, and it's a product for managing data as, as knowledge graphs and creating knowledge graphs. And um, I have a little example here that actually has a data about uh, Tom and Sarah 
according to this, you know, entertainment anthology. So you see uh, that uh, Sarah have acted in in the, in the post the movie in this role, uh, uh, Tony Bradley, and um, you see her name um, and uh, gender and given name, etc. And if I wanted to go to to Tom, I I also have a similar kind of information, and I could keep uh, expanding the graph and um, see more and more information. So there is some information about White Plains and um, that the movie post was post uh, was filmed in, some information about population and, and so on. So um, it is a graph, so it's uh, interesting to look at it as a, as a graph. And we have a, a feature there that here that allows us to do this. So let me um, let me make it a bit larger. So you see Tom and uh, the fact that he's acted in the post, and we could um, we could expand and also see that Sarah has acted in this movie. And here we're going from the uh, from the movie. We're starting uh, from the data. We're starting to go into the model. So we see um, that. A type movie, and that's um, that's a class. And if we wanted to um, expand um, expand a little bit more, so let me um, go and just pick what I'm going to use. Sorry, I uh, the screen is there is the screen is real estate is a little bit. So you've got uh, you've got the type uh, movie, and we could you know keep expanding more, and we see that it's subclass of administrative area, and it's a class movie. And if we wanted to see more of a model uh, in terms of how properties are defined, you know there's quite a bit of richness here, and um, we could see all this all these properties of the movie also uh, as part of the graph. So seamlessly going from data to the uh, actual definition of the, um, of, of the model. And as I go back to, um, as I go back to my data, there is a couple of things that, a um, couple of more things that I want to show that I will talk about in the slide shortly. Um, but um, there's also, a standard serialization or the way to represent this data as as a graph. So let me uh, add if information to this link and say that uh, Tom uh, has played a role of Ben Bradley in this movie and save changes. And then we'll take a look and see how it looks like um, in in the standard serialization. So you see this uh, IDs of the nodes that I've talked about. You see the data, the birth date, family date. You see this is how um, uh, additional information is hanged on a node itself called, you know, the role Ben Bradley. And if we wanted to look at the prefixes, so this is how prefixes are defined with Wikidata and some other prefixes we use in our model. So let's take a look a little bit more at this uh, serialization. We see that there are um, a family name and a given name. And if we look at the information in the form and the information that would be available to us in the query if we were to access this data, we see that uh, there is also a full name, but it's not actually captured in the data. So where does it come from? It actually comes from inference rules. I've mentioned inference a few times before, and when you look at um, this information, there is um, a number of rules that have been defined here that uh, take available data and infer additional data. So this is one of the rules that is quite simple. Basically, it takes a given name and a family name and concatenate it to create a full name. And there are some 
you know, some reacher rules here as well. But this is what's uh, managed by the knowledge graph based on the models. And even though the full name doesn't exist, it's still presented to you and is available to you as if it did exist. Um, so let's um, go back to our presentation. And um, so I just showed uh, how to add information to this to this acted in note. And you may have been you may have noticed that in the previous slides, although I represented in the knowledge graph everything that was that was in the property graph, I did not uh, represent one thing, which is this information about the note. You know what what role uh, Tom um, acted in in this in this movie. And uh, this is because there is another difference between property graphs and um, an RDF knowledge graphs. In a property graph, each um, link, each edge has its own identity. Uh, if you remember, uh, we had this acted in with ID 10 and another acted in with ID 14. In RDF knowledge graph, it's actually uh, the same acted in. So how do we um, how do we add information to it if if the link is the same whether it goes from Sarah or whether it goes from Tom? There is an approach for doing it. There is a formal model for doing it called uh, RDF reification, where basically you take um, you take this uh, triple fact, which is Tom acted in the movie The Post. And you reify it by creating another node, uh, this example 126 node, and you say that it reifies this triple, this fact, because um, you say that the subject of this node is Tom, the object of this node is a movie, and then the predicate is this acted in link. And then once you've done this, you could hang additional information on it such as that he played the role of Ben Bradley. So this um, sounds to some extent complex, but as you saw in this demo that we just did, it, it doesn't have to be complex at all. You know, I just entered Ben Bradley and uh, tools take care of it and um, how it's, uh, how exactly it's, it's, it's stored. It's all, it's all managed by the tools. So the, the important part that there is a standard way of of doing this. And there is a short format for it um, called RDF star reification. Re that's what we use in, in our product. And a longer interchange format as well. Um, and this type, um, this node is called, is of type RDF statement. So that's kind of how formally it's defined in, in the models. Um, so this brings us to this uh, additional difference is in a property graph, each relationship is uniquely identified already. So this each combination of a node, link, node um, is uniquely identified by this relationship. And you could annotate these relationships with additional facts. You can't annotate properties with additional facts because they just hang off of the, of the nodes. They themselves don't have identity and there is no way to give them identity. In RDF, um, all the properties are used. So you can't simply use a property to identify this node link node triple, but you, there is a way to give it an identity through you know, this reification uh, method. And once you do that, you could annotate any connection with additional facts, whether it's a connection between Tom and movie, or whether it's a connection between Tom and his birth date, you use, um, you use the same approach for it. Um, so one of the important um, value propositions for graphs in general is their um, availability. Uh, with that, I'd like to kind of talk about how you could evolve property graphs and how you could evolve knowledge graphs, sort of test this uh, stress test this availability quality. So let's say you have a property graph and we've got white plains, it's a city, white plains has population. Uh, but of course, when you look at white plains, you recognize that it may have different populations 
And it's not that it has uh, these two different or five different populations at the same time. It has these different populations at different points in time. So how can we say that uh, this population is 2018, this population is uh, 2010, or whatever that may be? Uh, in order to do this, you can't really um, do it for the property in a property graph. So in order to do that, you need to turn a property into a relationship. You need to change your graph structure. And um, here's one way of how you may change the graph structure. So you create additional nodes. You say that they are populations. And then you hang the size and year property from them as a as property. Or you could hang a year of this edge, and there's possibly some other structures uh, for doing this. The important point is that you can't really, you know, you can't keep this structure. You have to you have to change it to something like this. Once you change the structure, this means that the queries that you you created and the applications that you have developed that relied on the structures would, would need to be uh, modified. Now, how do we do this with RDF? Well, using the method that uh, I just showed, so you've got two separate nodes, each of them representing population. You um, can now uh, create another node that will represent this, this fact. And then you could add a year value to it. The important point here is that we haven't, uh, we have evolved our graph. We have added more to the graph. It's grown larger, but we haven't changed anything if, of what was already before. So there is still a link between uh, between white plains and and the population. We've just added something to the link. So what that means is that if you have developed um, any queries, rules, applications that depend on um, this information being captured in the graph, they they could uh, be as they are. You could, of course, take advantage of additional information, but at least you have not broken anything. Now, let's consider another change case. So we said that Ben Bradley um, is a role that Tom has played in the, in this movie, and uh, we're just using a string, a textual value, Ben Bradley. But uh, we may want to actually uh, talk about a specific resource or a node, Ben Bradley, because Ben Bradley is a real person. There is some information about this person. So we may want to say that Tom has um, play the role of that person as opposed to just having a string. So again, uh, if you're using a property graph, you have to change your graph structure. You can no longer have this information hanging off this, um, of this relationship. You have to create um, another node, you know, saying uh, with the type movie portrayed, movie character or portrayed in a movie or something like this, that would be a person. And then um, you could you could link to it. So again, there is a change in the graph structure. In case of the knowledge graph, we use exactly the same approach. So we had Ben, ben Bradley as as a string. We could we could simply change it to um, be a node that is not a string, but rather an ID, and that could seamlessly connect us to let's say entry in a uh, Wikidata graph that has additional information about Ben Bradley. So uh, from the evolvability perspective, um, there are some differences here where with property graphs, changes are more likely uh, require restructuring of the graph and uh, changes, possible change, likely changes to impacted queries and so on. And um, RDF knowledge graphs, in that sense, are more malleable. You really evolve and extend them, and you could preserve more from your uh, logic and application code. They're kind of better protected as you evolve the graph. You also 
don't really need to restructure your data, you just add to your data. To your data. And um, a few other differences that I've um, showed in the demo. Um, well, actually, um, one difference has to do with queries. I didn't really show it in the demo, but I sort of alluded here by talking about um, talking about queries. And of course, if you have data in a graph, you want to use it. If you uh, want to use it, you need some approach to querying this data. There is a standard query language for the acknowledged graph that, graph that is supported by all systems that implement RDF knowledge graph. There is um, no de jure standard for property graph query languages. There are some um, some things, some queries languages such as Cypher, which came from Neo4j, that is implemented by more than one uh, property graph vendor, but not necessarily by all. And um, they also have some differences in, in the implementation since it's not uh, really a standard. Um, there's also some propri proprietary languages, query languages that each um, vendor provides. Increasingly, what we notice in industry, there is a move to support GraphQL, which is a query language from um, originally from Facebook, but it became de facto industry standard. And you could think about GraphQL as a possible common denominator um, in, the, in the space because uh, vendors in the property graph space and in knowledge graph space well, support uh, GraphQL. It's a, it's a pretty rich topic. The whole topic of query probably could be a topic of uh, webinar of its own. So if you have interest in it, let's, let us know and we could talk about it uh, more outside of the webinar. Also, we have a white paper that has been written on this property graph versus knowledge graph comparisons, and there is more about query languages in, in the white paper. And, um, the thing that I did show in the demo is serialization. So there is a standard serialization for RDF. The way to take graph in, uh, in the knowledge graph system and export it in a text, textual format. Or the way to take text and load it into the knowledge graph system. Um, there are standard serialization formats. You've seen one in the demo. And here you could see how uh, it's uh, Represented in the text, so this would be a subject node. This is an edge or a predicate. This is an object node, so triple facts like this. And um, here is another one. So again, we're talking about this subject node, and now acted in edge, and acted in this movie. And uh, this is how uh, this RTF reification is supported by hanging more information on specifically on this edge. So um, differences in the serialization, property graphs have some proprietary serialization formats um, and maybe some programs that you have to uh, write. And then the standard serialization in this RDF knowledge box space. Um, another difference is um, based on this unique, uh, unique IDs and how composing of the graphs is, is supported. So knowledge graphs are self-organizing, they can be composed. So we can have a graph like this that talks about some data element in some data set stored in some system. We could talk about some system running on some server in some uh, data center, and then um, something about location of this data center. Um, through this unique identifiers, we could bring this information together, and you get connections between them. So because the URI or ID of this node was the same in both graphs. And then you could also build connections between nodes in different, uh, different graphs. And then you could infer additional uh, connections based on uh, location and maybe if you um, have some GDPR type of information about uh, personally identifiable information and some location, you could do further inferencing 
uh, based on it to say what can be stored someplace and what cannot be stored. So these consistent identifiers with nodes and links uh, gives us ability to merge graphs together and infer additional facts. So that's um, our connectivity um, difference the fact that you could partition graphs, you could distribute them, and then you have uh, the formal framework for merging and connecting them. Uh, now that I've uh, talked about um, these differences and similarity, let me talk about some use cases. Why would you want to use um, graphs and knowledge graphs specifically? So there's quite a number of use cases. One important use case has to do with this uh, move um, that is currently underway in, uh, in enterprises from data centric uh, versus application, uh, from application centric versus data centric architecture. So moving from application centric to being data centric. And I'm not gonna read this busy slide, you'll get the slide, but you see the main differences focused on data being self-describing, uh, with data sharing built in, data being active because the semantics of it is in, in the data. Uh, let's take a look at uh, an example of why self-describing data is important. So you see a bit of a data here. Um, it's an open data about road safety and vehicles, etc. So if you look at it, it's an interesting data, but you know, at least to me, it's not particularly meaningful. There is some metadata, but I don't really understand what this means, F7, F8, etc. Um, so data, when you try to share it, when you try to use it, it's only as good as its metadata. If you can't understand it, you can't really use it. Here's another example of the data. And as a person, it's more understandable to me because at least there's meaningful names that I as a person can interpret. But if we want applications to use and interpret this data, we really need to have much more structure and much more semantics and richness. So we need to know uh, whether something is required, what format, it takes what rules may be associated with it, et cetera. So um, with respect to data and being able to share data, here are some key facts. So if metadata is not readily available, you can't really understand the data. If it's separate from data, then applications can access it. And uh, it's important uh, for you know, metadata to be uh, together with data because it's, if it's some, someplace different, uh, it, you know, you have kind of silos, fragmented systems where metadata gets stale and out, outdated. It's also important for this metadata to be captured in a standard way um, because that's key to sharing. Um, and that brings me to uh, another, you know, we very short demo that I want to do. So far I showed an edge, um, kind of a neutral data about uh, some entertainment, Tom Hanks, movies, etc. But what Tabred um, is mainly for is uh, a composition of knowledge graph to support adaptive data governance. It comes with a lot of pre-built asset types that talk about uh, databases, data sources, applications, forms, reports, etc. And they all come together to um, to form this uh, to form this knowledge graph. And I'm gonna um, show just a very small example of, of it. And um, so this is uh, information from some you know, medical enterprise and you see, um, for example, information of the medical enterprise and you see that I have some um, catalogs of systems, I have some catalogs, technical assets, some catalogs of uh, forms, reports, I have some um, data sources that I, I used here. So if we take a look at um, here, I've got some forms and reports. And if we look at the um, patient discharge form, you see some information about it, more documentation, the individual items that uh, or data elements that compose this form, exchanges that form participates in, and um, it's connected throughout enterprise with uh, different applications and systems. And I could take a look at it in this kind of a reach of view where you see this is how patient discharge form 
different systems that contribute and different processes that contribute to creating this information and also different enterprise stakeholders and the roles that um, that contribute to it. And these links are clickable. You could get more details, but it's a logical lineage, uh, application kind of lineage, uh, data lineage, et cetera. But um, so this was a very short demo because we've been uh, getting uh, close to our allotted um, to our allotted time, and I do want to leave some some time for for questions. So this, I'm just going to leave this slide here. It shows how models support data capture. So in in our customers, we have uh, a number of customers that have started by using property graphs because property graphs have been known uh, to be easy to get started with. But they also ran into some uh, dead ends and some, some challenges. And you could see them here, and essentially I covered them when I covered uh, differences um, have to do with not being able to capture schema, with not being able to use inference, um, you know, lack of connectivity, et cetera. Um, so with that, we have um, some customers that have been moving from the property graphs implementation to knowledge graph. And if you find yourself in this position, there is um, a well-defined and structured approach to transitioning. Um, so you could get your data out of the property graph as is. Some um, tools such as Neo4j will even generate one of our DF standard representations for you or a program can be written, you're not going to get a model out because the property graphs don't capture the model. But a tab right edge, for example, will introspect your data and will generate a model for you. And that may that model may need to have need to have some tweaks and refinements to take advantage of uh, capabilities of the knowledge graphs. Um, so some iterations will be needed. But that's a good starting point. And then with respect of uh, migrating application code and queries, that would be the next step. And as I mentioned, GraphQL is often uh, a common denominator. So if you're already using GraphQL, then you may be able to reuse uh, at least some of your queries. So in, in summary, some key takeaway points. So graphs are increasingly are important to enterprises um, for their flexibility, for ability to support data sharing. They are an excellent choice for a number of applications, including this transition to data-centric enterprise representing metadata. There are two property graphs, uh, two, knowledge, two graph models, property graphs and knowledge or RDF graphs. Uh, traditionally, property graphs um, have had a pretty mature implementation, for example, Neo4j, which pioneered property graph space. Um, in, in the past, knowledge graphs were considered to be um, more academic, but um, recently, I mean, recently, probably within the last five to 10 years, lots of uh, products and tools have been developed, and there is now mature implementation and support for knowledge graphs. They support production systems running for quite a number of years, and um, this technology makes it uh, just as easy to use knowledge graphs as, as property graphs. And as I described, it's possible to move from your property graph implementation kind of to graduate it to a knowledge graph in some logical steps. So with, with that, I switch it to uh, Shannon and um, see what questions we have. Irene, thank you so much for this great presentation. Uh, we do have a lot of questions coming in here. Uh, just to answer the most commonly asked questions, just a reminder, I will send a follow-up email to all registrants by end of day Friday for, the, for this webinar with links to the slides and links to the recording. So diving in here, Irene, what is the difference between a knowledge graph and a conceptual data model? Well, um, a conceptual data model can be implemented as a knowledge graph. It's, uh, it's kind of an idea. Uh, a knowledge graph is a standard set of standards supported by a technology, so it's an actual implementation. But you could take your conceptual data model, 
expresses as an ontology within the knowledge graph and start populating it with data. So if you have conceptual model about you know, people, movies, actors, et cetera, uh, put it in the knowledge graph as is. There is a way to create classes, create properties. I didn't show that, but we have quite a number of demos uh, around it. You create it exactly the same way you create the data. So you have your model living in the graph, and then immediately you have ability to you know, populate it with data, start entering data, start loading data, and so on. And I mean, this question came in earlier, uh, but uh, and I think you covered a little bit of it, but isn't a property graph a type of graph database and a knowledge graph is a, an application of graph database? In other words, can't a property graph be used to create knowledge graphs? Wouldn't it be more accurate to compare RDF and property graphs? Um, yeah, so let me, so I, I've described that there is two different data models. So there is a property graph data model with uh, nodes and then edges and then properties hanging off the nodes. And then there is RDF data model where there are resources um, connected by, by links but it's, uh, where everything is a node. Yeah. So uh, when you talk about properties in the RDF world, it's uh, relationships between resources that have IDs as well as the relationship between the resource and the literal, et cetera. And there is a way to actually put your data model, your ontology into, into this graph. So there is a standard you know, um, data model and built on that standard mo data model, there is standard knowledge representation languages such as shackle, shapes, and constraint language, which we use for expressing models, for example. And I was um, uh, a leader of the working group, uh, chair of the working group at WCC World by that consortium that developed uh, shackle about three years ago. And now it's supported by all ma major RDF database vendors and you know, uh, vendors like ourselves uh, for the for top edge. So um, we, Referring it as, an, as, to, as a knowledge graph because you could actually store the knowledge, the model, the rules in the graph itself. While in a property graph, you can't do that. You have to keep it separate so you could only have your data and the semantics of the data are in program, um, in some requirement documents, in people's heads. And um, as you saw the definitions of the knowledge graph that I started with, they all talk about semantics, ontologies, schemas. So if you follow that type of a definition of the knowledge graph, then you, know, you can, can't really say that the property graph can be a true knowledge graph. You could, of course, you know, come up with some different definition of a knowledge graph. Thank you. I think we have time to slip in one more question here. Um, is building inference rules the same as creating nodes and edges? For example, links established so the uh, inference can be made? In some ways it is. Um, so in which way is it the same? So it is, it is the same in a way that you also put those rules in a graph. So if I, you know, if I had time, if someone is interested, I could show, I, I would be able to show how a rule looks like in a graph. So it is a resource of a type rule. There is a language for creating it. It is stored in a graph, so you could actually query your rules if you wanted to. You could reason not only using rules, but you could uh, kind of uh, so meta meta. You could reason over your rule base in terms of what kind of rules you have. So in that sense, it is it is the same, but you know you do need a way to represent your knowledge, and I've already mentioned Shackle. So Shackle is, uh, offers you a way to say, so I have people, and people have names, and names must be strings, and people have date of birth, and date of birth must be integer, and there must be only one date of birth, and people could um, have parents, and those parents are also people. So you could you could have information. You could uh, it's, it's a language that gives you a way to say things like that. But it's also a language uh, that gives you a way to say rules. For example, if both parents 
uh, have blue eyes, then a child will also have blue eyes. So it gives you a language for saying all of this and capturing all that richness in, in the knowledge graph. Well, Irene, that does bring us to the top of the hour here. I will uh, send over so all the remaining questions that we've had. There have been some great questions from the uh, attendees today. And thanks for all being so engaged in everything we do. It's been such a great presentation. And again, just a reminder, I will uh, send a follow-up email by end of day Friday to everybody with links to the slides and links to the recording as well. Thanks, Irene, and thanks to Top Quadrant for sponsoring today's webinar. Appreciate it. Thank you, Shannon. Thanks all, have a great day and stay safe out there.